So good morning and welcome to this webinar. Um, well, welcome to this webinar organized by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions um, in the context as a side event to the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development on the subject of informed citizens, societies and governments for sustainable and resilient recovery. I'm very happy to welcome everyone here today and to welcome some great speakers who will meet shortly in order to talk about information and why information matters so much. For a library organization like IFLA, we're all about information, providing people with meaningful access, but it's often, this is often something that is taken for granted. Information is something that is utterly vital for us whenever we take a decision in order to find, about, find out about opportunities, in order to exercise our rights. Information is a precondition. It's something we cannot do without. It's something that appears across the sustainable development goals. In 20 targets, explicitly or implicitly, there's mention of the need for information, the skills to use it, the services to be able to use it. And yet, as I said, it's so often taken for granted or not looked at in a holistic, comprehensive way. For us, we believe that a more informed society is one that is better able to grow, better able to seize the possibilities open to it and advance at the individual level, at the community level, at the national level. Yet at the same time, often today, when we talk about information, it's in a negative sense. We talk about infobesity, the idea of there being too much information. We talk about the infodemic, the idea that information can be a hazard. Now, many of these things are arguably true, but this is all the more reason to try and take a comprehensive, uh, holistic approach in order to how we can make sure that the potential of information is there, it's realized for all, rather than it being seen as a harm, something that needs to be controlled, restricted. So in order to talk about this, I'm very glad to be well, uh, joined by three fantastic speakers from the library fields in different parts of the Asia Pacific region. I will be introducing them one by one as we go through our program. And we're going to look at three questions in turn, looking at their own experience of why access to information matters for development, the impact of the pandemic on the supply of and demand for information, and the recommendations they'd make. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Vicky McDonald, who is a key player in the transformation of the library sector in Queensland, Australia. She's currently the state librarian and CEO at the State Library of Queensland and has held various roles in public, academic and state libraries. She's also very active in professional associations as a past president of the Australian Library and Information Association and currently chair of the ALIA, Australia Library and Information Association International Relations Advisory Committee. She's also currently chair of the IFLA Professional Committee, chair of the IFLA Congress Advisory Committee and is next officio member of the IFLA Governing Board. So with that, it's over to you, Vicky, to offer your thoughts on drawing on your experience, why access to information in all of its dimensions is so important for development, Vicky. Um, thank you, Stephen, and thank you for the opportunity to join the discussion today. And uh, I think, you know, as you said uh, in the beginning, uh, often access to information can be taken for granted and people's access to the skills the, and also the information. And one of the things that I would like to talk about is some of the work that we're doing here at the State Library of Queensland within that context. Uh, so the State Library of Queensland has a, a responsibility to serve the people of Queensland. And... Um, and one of the things that we're particularly include, uh, concerned about is digital inclusion. So, and the access that people have to information online. And in Australia, we have something called the Australian Digital Inclusion Index. And this index measures the extent of digital inclusion in Queensland. And we've been following the, um, the results for Queensland for some years. And, um, and, you know, irrespective, I think, what people might think, um, not everybody in Queensland has access to digital information. They don't have connectivity and they don't have PCs in their homes. So there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, when we look at that in digital inclusion index, we see that Queensland actually ranks five out of eight of the Australian states in 
um, in, in Queensland, in Australia rather. So there's there's some work to be done. And we also, when we look at the index, that we can see that there's some areas and populations and communities within Queensland that don't rank well in digital inclusion. Particularly, there is a gap between city and country. Um, Queensland is a very uh, decentralised state, uh, very remote areas, particularly up in Torres Strait and out into the west. So it's a very different um, experience for Queenslanders. We also know that older people and particularly families um, are vulnerable and, and don't have access to information. They don't have access to the internet. Um, and of course, the internet is how you actually um, access a lot of information now. And, and particularly um, older people, vulnerable people were particularly isolated during the COVID pandemic because they don't have that access. Um, people aged 80, six, over 65 are particularly vulnerable, as well as people in some of our remote uh, First Nations communities, so Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So we've actually been involved in developing and, and delivering a number of programs uh, across Queensland. Tech Savvy Seniors, which is focused on um, people over 65 years of age, uh, Deadly Digital Communities, which focuses on uh, digital programs servicing um, the communities in rural and rural Queensland, particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations. And another one is actually digital health literacy. So a slightly different one. Uh, and um, I'm happy to talk about any of those, um, Stephen, if, if there's something particularly that you'd be interested in. Thank you. I, I think that, that what you've mentioned there is it, it, it's a key theme that we come across. And I think for those of us jo joining on joining today, we're joining a webinar. Um, clearly, we are able to connect to the Internet to sufficiently yes. good speed to be able to do this. What is the impact of not having this access to information? And we're talking about digital inclusion and, and clearly, I don't know, we take it for granted that this is a good thing. What are the impacts of digital exclusion of a lack of access to information that justify this focus? Well, I think um, I think we, we just have to reflect ourselves on how much we use the internet to access, informa access information. So you can imagine the fact that people don't actually have access to the internet in some of these communities means that they can't communicate with their family, their friends, they can't con communicate with um, health departments, uh, government departments, but also they can't complete forms. So much of the business of today is actually conducted on internet. So they're at a great disadvantage in the fact that they actually don't have that ability to communicate with government, to communicate with family, friends, but also to do their business. So that impacts their um, social well-being, but also their economic um, aspects of their lives as well. Um, and also, um, as I mentioned, we've been involved in a, a program on, on health literacy, so it can actually um, impact on their well-being as well because they're unable to access information um, around health and how to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Thank you. That, I mean, that, 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 that's such a powerful message. And I think clearly Asia Pacific is such a hugely diverse region, mm. but it's important to remember that even in, in the richer parts of the region, the most developed parts of the region, there are still these, these gaps, this need to improve information access to actually allow people to have this because the costs of non-access are visible. I, I'm going to pass on now to Dilara to, to, to ask the same question. But just to begin, I want to introduce Dilara. So Do Dr. Dilara Begum is the Associate Professor and Chairperson in the Department of Information Studies and Library Management at East West University in Dhaka. She's, she's studied both in Dhaka and from Punjabi University in India. And her research interests include information management, digital libraries, uh, information literacy, open access, and other issues. She's also very active in the, in the association space, acting as information coordinator at the Asia and Oceania section of, of, of IFLA. Um, she's acting general secretary of DLNet SA. She's also played significant roles, for example, as country coordinator of, the information, of an information literacy consortium sponsored by UNESCO, has been a standing committee of ESIL, which works on information literacy, and has been elected Senior Vice President and Women's Affairs Secretary of the Library Association of Bangladesh. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Dilara and ask you, based on your experience, why is access to information so important to development in all its dimensions? Dilara. 
Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for inviting me. Greetings from Bangladesh uh, and uh, very good morning for, from Bangladesh because it's early in the morning here. So access to information is very important for any development, for any sector, not only particular sectors, sector, because information needed in everywhere for agriculture sector, for development sector, for well-being, for health se sector, everywhere. So I work for academic library that is in East Coast University. So our community is academicians. So we try to connect with the academician with their desired information. But the thing is that we have to think about the whole country. Uh, we, uh, I will give some examples in Bangladesh because in Bangladesh, actually, especially in COVID-19 situation, we are depend on actually uh, 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 from the internet connectivity because if you wanted to access the information, you need to have the internet connectivity. This is very important. But because of the digital divide, sometimes it's very, very difficult for everybody to access the information. So access the information for development is very, demandable but thing is that whether we are getting that information um, uh, uh, from the from the right uh, track like the what are the contents is we have to think about the um, uh, content we, we, accessing information is okay of, of course internet is essential but whether we're getting the right information whether we're getting the you know um, uh, the uh, you know content is uh, you know that is uh, you know uh, accessible to the uh, every people so that's why for the development purpose, every sector needed information. You cannot say that I don't need any information. And in that case, the library can play a vital role because you know, accessing to information, it's a human rights. People want information for well-being. People need information for their development. People need information for research work, for organizational development, for uh, innovation purpose. So everywhere, everybody need information. But whether we're getting the right information. That is a uh, big question because we are surrounded by information, everywhere information. Um, people are uh, difficult to identify what is misinformation, disinformation, and you know about the infodemic, the massive amount of information is growing everywhere. And uh, in Bangladesh, uh, uh, there is a study I have done, and in, in that study, we have seen that most of the people are getting information from uh, the social media, especially the Facebook. So whatever the information producing and they are getting from the Facebook. So that is very alarming because they, these people are not that much media information literate, not so, uh, everybody. So it is difficult for them to identify whether that information are coming from the authentic, authentic sources. So authentic source uh, need to like, if you wanted to find out, you have to be literate. So literacy is a very important thing. So in that case, I can give you one example. Um, Oxfam is one of the uh, you know NGO over here. They are really working a very good, uh, innovative work is going on over here, um, especially in agriculture sector. The project name is Protec. Protec uh, is a project name that means participatory access uh, research with the help of ICT. So this this innovative uh, in this project basically they develop apps for the farmers and uh, they give the uh, the mobile phone to the farmers uh, for the farmers in in the village area so by using and they, they also giving the training it's, uh, under this project they're giving the training so farmers they are basically using that apps for their agriculture research purpose like what kind of seeds they have to use use what are the fertilizer is needed for their you know uh, land so this kind of activities is going on over here and you know in in, in agriculture field especially for the farmer they are benefited so they are getting access the information, the agriculture information through that apps. So this is a very innovative initiative taken by the Oxfam. So, so uh, rather than this, many organizations are working really uh, try their level best in this sector to get to provide the information, right information for the right people. Like uh, East Coast University, we are tried our level best because we uh, are information specialists. We have a you know, department over there that is information studies and library management. So. 
being a faculty members and uh, students and and library and I uh, because I'm also look after the East West University Library so so whole people are, are we are trying our level best to provide the right information uh, for the right people like we observe um, you know media information literacy week uh, since 2017. Uh, we have incorporated this uh, uh, information literacy, uh, you know, uh, course in our curriculum. So, uh, so these are the activities we are doing. Even there is another organization I can give you the example that is called Builds, Bangladesh Institute for Information Literacy and Sustainable Development. They do organize some training for program, especially for the youth. Uh, they are emphasis on the youth literacy. So, um, uh, um, so they just organized this, uh, you know, workshop in different different area of Bangladesh, different cities of the Bangladesh. Because I live in Dhaka city, the capital city of Bangladesh, but you know, some other city like Chittagong, uh, Silhat, they need this kind of, uh, you know, information because information is for everybody. Not in, it's, it's there is no boundary. So that's why I can say for uh, development, uh, in, uh, you know, you need information for better health, you need information for gender equality, you need um, uh, uh, information for sustainable infrastructure, because without infrastructure, you cannot uh, you know, provide the information and it should be sustained, sustainable. Uh, and for poverty, um, uh, if you wanted to improve your agriculture, uh, support the people in uh, health uh, or well-being, for cultural development, and research and innovation, innovation purpose, access to information is very important. Thank you so much. And I really like the fact that you brought out that there's a, there's clearly connectivity is, is a key first step, but also we need to think about the content. Do you have access to the right information? Because just because there's lots of information out there, it doesn't mean that the information that will actually help you or make a difference is there. And it's very good that you mentioned the importance of information literacy, the ability to, to find, to evaluate, to use, to apply information effectively, as this is not clearly, this clearly is not a given. So that's, I'm, I'm really glad that you raised that and we can sort of begin to see that access to information is about more than, is a more complex thing. So now I'd like to hand over to Priyanka um, in order to hear from India. I'm aware that you've also got up early for this one, which I appreciate very much. Um, to introduce Priyanka quickly, um, Priyanka is, is, a, is a passionate progressive thinker who's driven to push social causes in South Asia. And her work is centered very much on building community resilience, applying participatory concepts and using inclusive and participatory approaches. And she works in order to build synergies and align the UN Sustainable Development Goals with her work where possible. She focuses a lot on identifying local solutions to adopt sustainable greening practices, smart growth concepts, sustainability, planning, integrate renewable energy and bring together intermediaries to support the overall, overall progress. And she does this through her role as the strategic program lead of the Special Library Program at the MS Swamanathan Research Foundation. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Priyanka in order to hear your views on, on why access to information in all of its dimensions is so important for development. Priyanka. Thank you so much. Good morning and namaste to everyone from India. Um, it's a privilege to be part of this discussion today. And it's a very important topic, um, be it 20 years ago, and it continues to be relevant even today. So when I started off my um, work almost 20 years ago in this whole idea of introducing information communication technology, uh, one of the interesting thing is um, UNESCO had then initiated this whole understanding of what does it mean to communicate with communities? What do you want to communicate to the communities? What is the lack and what is the information that's missing that's not allowing rural communities to feel more empowered and feel more um, you know um, successful in their own well-being it started there and through those initiation initial discussion um, some of the ngos were participating in these dialogues to understand how icts can play a very critical role in providing access to information to a lot of the communities who still remain disengaged. So the, the, you could call it the digital divide, you can call it the information divide, you can also call it as a gender gap. It still exists even today as I speak of this um, on why access
access to information is very, very critical. Um, so when we introduced the ICTs into the communities, what we understood is people are willing to cope and adapt to new tools and new um, skills, and they're able to take it forward when there is a lot of handholding that takes place with them. Uh, one of the critical things that we um, also felt is um, while introducing any kind of technology, they really need to be also um, nudged and supported to understand how to source that information. Because as the two great panelists said, there's so much of information that's coming out, you really don't know which is where you're being misinformed. So as we continue to do that for almost 20 years in the rural communities, I can tell you that specific key information uh, that supports the communities, like we work closely with farmers, specific information to what are the kinds of seeds that they can sow, what are the types of pests and diseases uh, that can be managed in the field, if you can give them specific information that they require so that their productivity increases, that's when the success takes place. And that's the kind of access to information we should be qualitatively driving for. Um, right now, with the um, advancements in technology and the rapidity with which, you know, it's changing, it's shifting gears. Almost every day there's a shift in the kind of technology that's being handed to the communities. There is, um, there is still digital illiteracy. I can uh, tell you that just before COVID, we were looking at statistics. In general, globally, we noticed that, you know, probably um, almost 50% of the community had access to internet, but there's still that 50% who did not have access to internet. I'm sure because of COVID and the drive, the need for technology has pushed that percentage further. But when you take it from a rural community perspective, who still don't have access to information are still not having internet connectivity. So there is connectivity issue. It still remains in many, many pockets. There's also a gender divide where probably around 12% of women um, in the rural communities of India um, have access to internet, but they're not, they may not know what sort of information to access. Um, there are still the poor women who don't have access to smartphones or any kind of technologies to make informed decision-making. Um, and that divide still remains despite 20 years of work that's unfolded in India. I would also like to share over here that um, in India, uh, we do have something called Right to Information Act, uh, which was conceived in 2005. It was uh, one of the most um, acceptable, accepted and the most promising act um, where citizens felt that they have a right to ask the government, what are the basic services that's being offered by the government um, to make it as transparent and accountable as possible. And I can tell you that um, that particular system is working very well. A lot of people are actually approaching. There are a lot of queries. I understand that from every um, state, there is at least a minimum of 700 to 1,000 queries a day. And they have public librarians playing a key role as information officers trying to actually report back on what exactly is going on. So I'm now going to bring a slight connect to the work that we're doing through the Swaminathan Research Foundation. Our our public librarians have been able to showcase that public library can be a knowledge hub. The reason why I'm bringing this connect is the Swaminathan Research Foundation had come up with this concept called Every Village a Knowledge Center 20 years ago by Professor Swaminathan. He's a visionary and he felt that every individual in the rural community has a right to know and learn and make their lives better. So he was looking at empowering uh, communities at a much, much earlier state in India. And right now we had the opportunity to scale up the idea from actually creating a community hub to a physical institution that already exists where public access is there. What we did notice is that um, access to information, there's a lot of uh, information that's out there. There is a lot of learning needs, but librarians, um, need a space where they can understand how they can support social impact and support social development. That's the gap which we were trying to address in the association that we have had with the, um, you know, uh, with the library, with almost 80 public librarians in South Asia. It has been a fantastic journey and I would like to uh, definitely say that uh, there is still more to do with access to information. There's lots going on there and we really need to look at the learning needs of the community, which has to be like synthesized and made sure that it supports 
their requirement and it fulfills their need so that they feel more empowered and capacitated. Um, so with that, I will kind of like um, I hand it back to you, Stephen. Um, if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to um, respond to that. Thank you very much. And I, I think it's a really key point that you're making there that this is a, a persistent issue that there was you, you you were looking at this 20 years ago we're still looking at this now that a lot of work has been done but firstly obviously we're in a changing landscape and so what works 20 years ago won't necessarily work today but also we're dealing with a whole load of problems not least of course as you said the gender digital divide and this gap that exists there I did also I, I like the fact that you made the link with with uh, the right to information act in 2005 which highlights a new you mentioned lots of SDG areas there. Clearly, SDG 6, 6, 16 comes to mind, and the idea that access to information it helps in your personal life. It also supports democracy. I also really like the the point you made about the value of of, of mediation, the value of a space where people can come together and where it's possible to focus on how do you help people find the information they need, how do you direct people, um, and the value of that as a service. Um, I can already feel that some sort of really good answers to the third question are coming out in terms of recommendations on where to go. But first, I wanted to ask, and this will again be a question to all of you about, from your experience, what impacts has the pandemic had on the supply of and the demand for information? And so for that, with that, I'd like to turn to Vicky, your thoughts. Thanks, Stephen. And I think um, it's really interesting hearing the perspectives from across the Asia region, because I think there's so much in common, irrespective of which country you're in. I think, obviously, um, the big, big immediate change with COVID for us was the fact that back in March, we had to close our building, um, and which meant that nobody could come into the library. So we had to then think about how we were going to make our services and collections and, of course, information accessible to the people of Queensland if they couldn't actually come in and physically visit the building. And um, I think in a way we've actually, it's been a great opportunity to actually profile our collections and services and, and what we have. Um, we, um, we immediately had to think about how we could actually make this information accessible. And what we really reflect on is we already had a lot of information and it was really about how we curated that information to make it accessible for what people were looking. Um, so here in Queensland, one of the first things that happened was all the schools were closed and parents and carers became the teachers. Uh, and of course, this wasn't a role that they're familiar with um, and didn't have experience in. And I think it was pretty challenging for parents having their kids at home um, and, and how to educate them. So what we did is with our website, we created all these pages uh, called Learning From Home, where we brought together the information that we had already had and made it easily accessible um, to what pe parents particularly and students were looking for. So it was about you know, um, all our databases, linking them by subjects, online tutorials, but also some of the games and things like that that we had. We also have films. So we could actually link films to curriculum um, and that we knew that uh, our people were looking for. So um, that really became our first priority was supporting parents and carers in their homeschooling. And then we actually looked at how we could make other resources available as well. And, uh, and one of the things we, we obviously had planned to have exhibitions. Um, and um, so we couldn't have exhibitions on site. So we pivoted our exhibitions to online exhibitions. And I think everyone was trapped in their homes. We weren't allowed to go out of our homes. So we actually provided, I guess, entertainment to people. Um, and we pivoted one of our exhibitions called 20, which was 20 years of Queensland's photographs to an online exhibition, and then created whole events programs around that, where we engaged the community to in, um, engage with our collections, but to have conversations. So it was really an important aspect of us providing information, but also providing that social cohesion and activities for people to be involved in. Um, we developed reading at home clubs so children could engage with books, um, access, you know, that sort of information as well. So um, I think in a way COVID actually, one of the big things that came out of COVID for us was rethinking our service delivery, putting it in an online environment. And it, what it really enabled us is to reach all Queenslanders. So we do have that responsibility 
uh, to reach all Queenslanders, not every, just people who could come on site. And uh, there was a lot of innovative work that we did as well, which will carry forward um, to future years. So um, in, in Australia, there's a, a national day of commemoration for the wars, our participation in wars, and that's uh, commemorated rather on Anzac Day, the 25th of April. So we had to turn very quickly as to how we were going to mark this important day without people being able to come together. And uh, so we worked with a, um, a startup company called Alkira and um, people could use their Google Assist and um, uh, to actually ask us to do things for them, to lay poppies at the war memorial on Anzac Day. They could ask um, Google to play them um, the last post or to have a diary read to them. So a lot of innovative work came out of that, um, that challenge of COVID um, and that we had to respond to very quickly. So, um, and I think one of the things I also wanted to mention, Stephen, is when we were able to reopen our library, um, we had pretty strict um, guidelines and directives on us. And we were only able to initially have 10 people in our building. Although we're a really huge building, five stories, that sort of thing, 10 people. So we had to decide what's the first service that we're going to make available. Uh, and remembering we are a reference and research library. But what we realized is that people, many people in our community didn't have access to internet. So that was the service that we made available uh, for those 10 people initially was uh, to be able to access the internet, to be able to print and to be able to scan. And I remember on that first morning, the people who came in were applying for jobs. They had to submit applications to government and some were just wanted to be able to email or um, Skype with family overseas. So really important activities that they had not been able to do during a lockdown period. But that's what we prioritised um, in those early weeks of being able to uh, uh, have people back on site. Um, so the 10 people became 20. Uh, as, as restrictions eased and then increased to 100 and that sort of thing. But it was really important that that was the first service that we enabled in our building. Um, and after that came access to our on-site collections. But uh, we really did profile that access to the internet, to scanning, to printing and to our staff being available to provide that, that um, advice. So a bit, of a, a bit of a choppy answer for you, but... Uh, no, no, I, I, I think one of the things I, re, I, I really liked in there, and I think we've heard this in other parts of the world as well, that there's suddenly this realisation that a lot of activities that you wouldn't previously necessarily have thought about is being about access to information, so education, well-being, community building, social cohesion, these actually will have really important access to information angles to them. And yes. maybe normally you send the children to school and the teacher gives them the information, but suddenly you realise, well, actually access to information is important when you're at home. Yeah. And one of the good things that's come out of it is, you know, we realised just how important it was to link our, our collections to curriculum and make it easier for parents and teachers to access that information. So at the moment, we're working on a new online portal that will link our content to the uh, Australian curriculum. Um, we've we've a lot of digital stories, digitised content, and we will launch that in July, and that will be designed specifically for parents and teachers and students to access a lot of information. And I think it's the same in every country. People want to be able to find content that's related to their country. So if they're doing a search on trees or bushfires or artists, that they'll be able to find information related to Queensland on those topics, and that's what we'll make available through our portal, but also the curation role is really important, making it easy for people to find the information that they need um, as well. So that is, you know, that's been a direct outcome from that learning from home focus that we had during those initial stages of um, COVID. And we'll work with the education department and with teachers to make sure it actually is meeting the needs of, of teachers and parents. And, and, and that's also, especially given the light of the COVID pandemic, uh, and perhaps you'd have gone that way already, but certainly, and this is again a sense we have from elsewhere in the world, the pandemic has accelerated these efforts to actually really 
information available and, and there's been such an acceleration in the reliance on the use of, of online information and realization of the value of this curated information and this is clearly absolutely. also known absolutely and i guess one of the things that did occur um stephen was that um we actually um created a new role within our structure. We moved someone into this position. So we now actually have a director of digital delivery. So she works across the organization, focused on how our collections and services are accessible online. And, and as you say, we probably would have got there in a couple of years time, but we, um, we sped it up and we did it in a couple of weeks. Um, and everyone in the organization was focused on how we would do things digitally. We even moved to doing storytelling, like I guess in many parts of the world, doing storytelling online. And, and one of our most populous um, storytelling was Jajam stories, which is around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander storytelling, and of course picked up language, which relates back to that International Year of Indigenous Languages, which we're very focused on as well, and enabled us to, to really profile that to the broader community as well. Um, and and I think there's there's a really interesting point in there about having institutions like libraries, which are based on the ground. Um, they're not multinationals. They're not sort of huge institutions that are not rooted in their communities. The value of having people focused on information, information delivery with that local knowledge, with that those local collections can be really powerful. Yes. So. Okay, um, it was because I'd like to hear from, from Delara now on your experience of the impact that the pandemic has had on, on the supply of and demand for information in, in, in Bangladesh and, and in your experience. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Stephen. Uh, basically, you know, in Bangladesh, uh, or I, I don't want to say Bangladesh, in whole world, the information seeking behavior changed due to this COVID-19 situation. Because now people are more, they wanted to access the information virtually because situation demand, uh, because uh, we're not uh, able to go to uh, outside uh, take library. That's why access to information is now totally virtual. virtual. So people, they need that information virtually and as soon as possible because of uh, technological advancement in that technology can help you to get resources in a second in a minute so they are used to like this and um, in that case uh, what we are doing we are giving the remote access of our all resources for our you know um, ew communities swiss university community so that they can access that resources from their home it's like a, it's, they don't need to come to the physically to the library and we introduced the whatsapp based uh, virtual reference service like uh, if you wanted to need some information which uh, you are looking for instantly some some of the library and they will answer you uh, that so that is a unique thing we have introduced and we also introduced a, a web portal uh, in our website and put some of the you know e e resources which is freely available the open access resources which is very much useful and these are from the authentic sources we put some of the link like ifla the, we put it, that link over there because ifla doing a, a great job in this uh, regard access to the information and they also you know produce this uh, how to spot the fake news so the infographic presentation to how to spot the fake news so that information is very much helpful for the you know Bangladeshi community so uh, the, so the, in that web portal basically we put all the resources which is helpful for them and uh, we try to organize all the uh, you know, the events which we do in, in physical environment. Uh, so we are doing in online environment, like quiz competition, book reading competition, like we are observing some days like Independence Day of Bangladesh. So everything is going on. We are gonna, we are going, to, we are organizing the webinars in different, different areas, especially which is needed for this uh, pandemic situation, like uh, how to spot the fake news. So this, that, that kind of webinar we are organizing from our part. So not that only uh, we are doing and uh, people, what is the demand? Demand is actually is, is very high because they wanted to find out the authentic sources. They are looking for some information from the government, from the government website. So that is the demand for the public, the demand for the you know, university. So in that case, uh, you know, we are organizing some uh, online uh, information literacy program for the community. So that information on the literacy program, we are trying to give them the you know, tips, how to find out the authentic sources, how to evaluate it, how to use that information. Because content is everywhere, but you need 
to develop some skills to access that resources. So accessing resources uh, it depends on your skills. Some people are not that much skillful in Bangladesh. So we are trying our level best to build up that skill. The skill cannot build in a day, so it will take time. So, but we are trying our level best, giving some, some of the tips. And uh, the supply part, you know, um, in supply part, I think in COVID pending situation, we need to develop our infrastructure facilities because if it is not you know, established, then it will be difficult for us to, to disseminate the information for, uh, for the right people. And, uh, and it should be the infrastructure is developing infra infrastructure is very challenging job. And uh, it's when you develop, you, you have to think about the sustainability of this infrastructure. And in that case, you need to have a skill manpower. So that is also very important. So lack of skill, um, skill manpower is a barrier to supply the information. And uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in the informal library, we are also providing the consultancy services for the library members for their mental health uh, you know, well-being. Because people are frustrated. Because we are uh, in the lockdown situation during uh, last one year, like we have closed everything in 17 March, 2020. So it's one year gone. So people are frustrated. They don't know what to do. So we are trying our level best, giving the mental health uh, consultancy service for our library members. And uh, it is really challenging to provide the physical resources in a virtual environment because of the you know, copyright law, because of you know, um, uh, some barriers, uh, technological barriers. And in accessing part is also different because of the digital divide. Because some people they don't have any access. Maybe um, uh, maybe they have access, but it's, it's a very poor connection. So it's, uh, internet connectivity is not that much, you know, speedy. So that are the problems are over here. But pandemic actually uh, help us actually uh, force us to go in go into the virtual environment because we don't have any you know option. Uh, we are not able to go to the library physically, so we have to access the resource, uh, you know, virtually. So virtual, virtually getting the information is a demand for everybody, and supplying information is a little bit challenging for information professionals in Bangladesh because of uh, skill manpower, because of lack of training. We do organize some of the training for the library staff and the information professionals for uh, you know, improving their uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, activities in online, how to improve that, how that use the different, different platform. Uh, like uh, we are taking online classes right now. The same stress is going on, everything is going on. Even the exams is also going on. So we have to familiarize with that platform. We are using Google Meet. Sometimes we are using Kahoot for, you know, for interactive learning. We are using you know, uh, Zoom for meeting purpose. So these are different, different platforms are coming up. So we need to give the training to everybody, not, not for only for the library professionals. You have to give the training to the students, how to access that resources, and the remote access of e-resources, because EW library is one of the you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, examples for other libraries, because it's a rich collection in terms of you know, e-resources. So if you have that resources, this is your duty to give them access. So uh, we are using remote access through My Athens, and we're providing that resources to everybody. And we're taking the statistics. And through that statistics, actually, we found that this the access in e-resources increased if you compare to the uh, other year. And in Bangladesh, uh, basically, uh, if you think about the population, 47.6 million uh, population is over there. And uh, in that population, maximum, maximum people are you know, young, like 10 to 24 years. And they are basically think about uh, uh, the internet, in, uh, you know, internet uh, access, accessible. They are, and, and this young generation is very, uh, I can say, dependable. They can work as a social change because they live with the internet. They always, uh, you know, uh, staying at the Facebook and some social media. So it's a big portion of the population. So we can use them. We can, you know, literate them. We can, uh, you know, give them the information to disseminate to the different, different um, sector. So they, they are very dependable. They can work as a social change. And in that case, we can attain sustainable development goals very easily, even in this pandemic situations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, 
And thank you again for just highlighting the, the, the degree to which the pandemic and the need to move to, to digital forms of information, digital forms of accessing information, not only underlines why access to information is so important across the board. And you mentioned obviously people studying, people researching, you mentioned mental health as an issue, that being able to work online, being able to access to information can be a force there. Um, I like the fact that, you know, again, I think this leads towards recommendations later, underlining the complexity of being able to supply that you need institutions with collections, but then you need skills, you need infrastructure, you need the right copyright laws to be able to give access to works online, which, which isn't a given by any means. But I, I like also the optimism that you've got a big sort of 10 to 24 age group out there who are ready and with the right skills can really be drivers of progress and can really use information effectively. So I'd like then to hand over to Priyanka on this question about the impact that the pandemic has had on the supply of and demand for information in India. Um, we've had very similar circumstances as well. Uh, when the lockdown happened, it happened just overnight. So we really didn't know what was going on. Uh, we were just informed that we cannot go out. So even access to basic supplies just stopped. And uh, I'm sure it's the same everywhere, but I think the operation wise, the way the lockdown um, approach was adopted between governments was a little different. So as we stepped in, it took at least close to two to three weeks before we could look at a coping and an ad adaptative strategy as individuals to come on board. So I did find that library librarians per se were not really sure what they can do, how they can do, um, how they can communicate to their users, because we were still handling our own personal lives. Um, and um, I think beyond that three weeks, we did notice that um, we needed to look at how we can support users specifically to mental health well-being and how can children be supported. I think um, all of us went through this point that the entire family for the first time was sitting together. They were really understanding what's going on in their lives and they needed to support one another. So parents had a tough time with the children being around and librarians there um, started to play a very critical role. I would say it did take some time, probably two months down the line, our librarians started to look at different ways in which they can support families. So one thing that unfolded in one of the uh, community library is that um, they took on the use of Zoom. They organized um, um, uh, just a virtual program where children can just discuss and just talk to each other. And then they allowed the children to then come up with an agenda as to what they'd like to learn. So they went on to look at how they can do home gardening. Then they looked at storytelling. They also looked at um, how they can come up with drawing of specific uh, topics related to UN SDGs and other related aspects for their communities. So like this, the children uh, stepped up. And over a period of weeks, we noticed that they came up with their own news channel and they call it the news at Kuti. This is a um, specific reference to Vallapatnam Gram Panchayat Library in Kerala, one of the Southern states in India. So this was a very innovative way in which children were engaged during the lockdown period. And parents found that uh, to be very supportive because it encouraged learning needs. Um, it allowed the children to look at um, not being focused on you know being in a center to a space but actually opening out and interacting digitally not socially perhaps and also staying connected with nature so i think these are basic requirements for an individual to feel more connected with mother earth and that kind of like um, brought a shift and having the news channel their own news channel to talk about the kind of services that they're providing was excellent they also had a debate with the editor a journalist where they can understand what is working, what is not working in terms of information. So I think like um, Wiki rightly said, you know, it's kind of like asked you to rethink and restructure ways in which you can stay connected with communities. That's the power that the pandemic has had while it has had its negative impacts. But I guess we were looking at positive ways in which we can cope and adapt. And for the first time, it's happened locally on its own. Usually there will be a structured mechanism. You know, somebody will be saying things as to what you can do, when you can do, how you can do. But this time, because a lot of librarians had the knowledge and they were already built um, 
um, to understand that they can feel empowered to support communities that really localize the entire system. And I think localization is very, very important for building the, the, the resilient communities, uh, knowledgeable communities. The other example, um, just like Dilara mentioned, there's another library in Kota. Um, uh, they, it is a small city in Rajasthan, in the state of Rajasthan. And, um, and the librarian there was, you know, he was very fidgety. He didn't like the idea that he was seated at home. And he found children uh, were wanting to read books. They just wanted to have access to books. There are many people who still cannot afford books. So what he chose to do is create a WhatsApp group and he called it knowledge at your doorstep. He just started off probably with just 10 children who are willing to read fiction and non-fictional books in their local vernacular. So he needed to source e-resources, which were completely based on local vernacular. And then slowly people started asking for e-newspapers. So again, he found contacts through his network and partnership. I think that plays a very critical role here. He had to use his network and part, pa, partnership um, uh, to be able to bring on these e-resources on board, which is again, um, should have, you know, specific policies that support copyrights and, <laughs> and open access. So he had to take care of all of that. And then, and then he started to send out this information in a matter of a week, his subscriber list went up to 500, then it went up to 1000 and he has now three WhatsApp groups. It's connected to almost um, six countries around the world. So it, because it was in local language, he was able to connect with communities from the other parts of the world who wanted that particular information. So that was the kind of um, rest natural restructuring that took place. Just a small idea, but it kind of like had a multiplier effect just because of that local um, language. And um, he strongly felt that if we had um, free access to these e-resources even beforehand, then the users that usually come to the library would have had access to it. Right now he has more than 5,000 library users, but right, but what he's able to, to whom he's able to provide access is only 2,700 members. So he still feels that um, you know, libraries must know their community, uh, which means knowing their you know con basic information, so that you're able to contact and connect with them and and stay connected over a period of time, so that when they are well informed, they're able to pass on the information to them based on their learning requirements. So uh, this this was an um, this was a specific example I wanted to share. Another example I wanted to bring to light is while many of us uh, think about. Um, you know, uh, being able to deliver, taking precautionary measures uh, from the home itself and using, um, you know, digital technology. I have, we have a librarian in the state of Andhra Pradesh in, um, in, 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 in a part of India, which is somewhere um, in the south. Um, he chose to actually step out. He took his mobile, he took his bike and he just went with books. He went with supplies that he could source from NGOs, from local partners. You know, um, we have corporate, corporate social responsibility uh, groups where institutions are willing to support local communities during times of such times. So they came up with all their um, um, masks and equipments and medical supplies, emergencies, whatever was possible. He sourced them from these partners and then he gave them um, to the local communities wherever he was associated with through his library. So the interest part was we saw two different uh, ways in which librarians um, addressed and uh, looked to adapting during this pandemic situation. Um, another example that I would like to share is that um, um, at the Swaminathan Research Foundation, we've been actually looking at delivering different models where ICTs can be made more relevant to the local communities. And like Dilara pointed out, just like Oxfam, we've also been uh, using tools um, that specifically focuses on the farmer's uh, productivity needs, you know, pest and disease management needs, and how do you look at the soil health, and how do you look at the overall well-being of the land that they're taking care of. So what happened during the pandemic was that this service did not stop. So there was a technological innovation that took place some two years ago in certain pockets of India. And we were able to also deliver this same thing through the public libraries. And it became um, a need for the farmers in at least four major libraries uh, in, South, in South India. And they wanted more information related to this. So what happened was 
the, they relied on this specific content that helped them to stop the pest and disease infestation because of which they had an increase in yield just in over a period of 10 to 15 days. So that's the kind of impact that happened. And farmers continued and they wanted the services to continue. We continued the services during the pandemic. So the point I'm trying to make here is that sometimes innovation can take place as pre-positioning for making sure that it supports the future vulnerable um, you know, circumstances that we are completely uncertain or unaware of. The other point that I'd also like to share over here is uh, when it comes to goal number three, good health and well-being, we've had um, telehealth program. So one of the concepts that we have uh, tried to work on uh, for more than 20 years is the hub and spokes model. So the hub and spokes model has allowed us to operate um, on providing key information services uh, to the local communities, depending on whether it's a health risk literacy or whether it is uh, mental wealth, health, um, well-being, or whether it is for farmers, you know, um, agricultural yield. So what this telehealth program did was we had partnership with the um, with the group of doctors who are willing to give specific communicable and non-communicable disease-based information um, almost um, of, on fortnightly basis. So based on the data that they received on the local uh, diseases that are coming up, the upcoming diseases, uh, and probably some of it were new, some of it were based on the old patterns, but they kind of like made sure that communities on an ongoing basis were informed about how do you keep yourself aware about your health? What are the precautions that you can take what are, the, what are the measures that you can look at in case if it is moving beyond a particular time frame? Whom do you contact? What are the kind of medications you should be looking for? Who you can take support? I think that was one thing that we were trying to bridge in terms of the information. We do have, we do have systems, but what many times what goes wrong is the synergies are not there, integrations are not there. And sometimes just because of our own individual fear, we really don't know whom to reach out to. So this kind of a support system kind of like allowed the uh, communities to feel more centered about, okay, I understand that this is the disease and I'm able to, I'm, I'm able to work myself towards it. And they're able to ask queries to the doctors on an ongoing basis, not just on one particular disease, but on different types of illnesses. So over a period of time, what they noticed is that they were willing to go to the doctors only when it was absolutely required. They were willing to go into the public health uh, uh, centers and uh, get them self-treated, knowing that there is free medications available for some of them. So these kind of information really supported the uh, communities over a period of time. And it the services continued even during the pandemic period. So there have been different ways in which um, communities um, have felt empowered through this process and access to information is the crux there. It's not uh, stopped. Um, we continue to seek that information and it, and it must not stop. If we want to build that resilient societies, I feel that every goal is interconnected in different ways and we need to make sure that we're able to provide those services. I think other librarians have also continued with storytelling uh, over a period of time. They've had uh, just to keep the children's engaged. The other thing is, how do you support senior citizens and also young children to use digital medium? A uh, lot of children who are, uh, where parents believe that children should not be using digital medium at a very young age have also been challenged. How do you introduce digital, um, uh, digital medium to the to, the, to their children. It was actually a very, very difficult thing. And some librarians have looked at how you can support the parents in taking digital literacy forward for their uh, children in a safe way. So these are some of the four examples that I'd like to share, which covers specifically to a couple of UN you know, SDGs and uh, the services continue to be operated. In case of the libraries as such, we could not open out the libraries until six months. So it was almost September to October when respective state governments opened out the libraries for their communities and they had to go through a process of um, making sure that all the COVID precautionary measures were put into place and then the book lending system started. Access to certain users were allowed probably 15 a day. So what do you do to the other users who really wanted the books? 
So what they did was those who don't have access to smartphones or don't have apps, don't understand how to use um, uh, the mobile phones or the tabs or the laptops, they don't know how, they don't even have uh, connectivity. Librarians have chosen to take the books and deliver it to their house. So that's the next thing that has happened. Usually it's the users coming into the spaces. Now librarians are looking at ways in which you can actually stay connected outside the library as well and make it into a two-way communication access. So these are specific um, examples that have unfolded. And now they are you know, expanding their spaces and making sure that more than uh, 20 to 30 are able to come into over a period of time and access uh, most of the resources that's available. Um, so yes, yes. Um, these are the specific examples that I'd like to share for today. Excellent, so thank you. And I think that was very rich. I was really glad that you brought in this topic of resilience, um, which is clearly a, a topic of this uh, this sustainable development forum. It's been a topic in the other sustainable development forum that have been taking place, and the importance of information as part of this, because clearly part of resilience is being prepared, having the information to respond, but part of it is being able to, when you're faced with uncertainty, at least access information in order to take better decisions about where to go forward. I also like the points you made at the beginning about, often we think about internet access, it, 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 it's, it can be quite lonely because it's just one person dabbing at a smartphone and it's global because you're working with Californian companies all the time. But just the points you made, the examples of how, especially when you have the sort of mediation that libraries can provide in the pandemic, we've seen that the internet can also be local and that it can be social and we can really realize that potential so well. So I, I'm gonna move on to the final question because we're getting into our last half hour and I'm aware that Vicky may need to leave a little bit early. Um, um, so to Vicky then, the final question is, is what recommendations would you make to decision makers about how they can better support access to information as part of the response to and recovery from COVID-19. And you're muted, Vicky. Thanks, Stephen, sorry. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the points and examples that Priyanka shared, I, I, you know, I think are, are very relevant in Australia and are many of the, you know, same initiatives. And, um, and Priyanka mentioned partnerships and the importance of collaborating. And I guess, um, I guess in decision making, so I'm sort of taking it from the library perspective, and I, you know, just uh, probably a little bit differently. But I think it's really important to think about your partnerships and who you can partner with, and and potential partners who actually have the shared same goals as you. And a couple of the projects that I mentioned back at the beginning of this session um, that we've conducted over a number of years, tech savvy seniors and deadly digital communities. We've actually partnered with um, government departments and also um, Telstra, which is the Australian tele telecommunications company. And they've actually provided cash to enable us to deliver programs with public libraries throughout the state. Um, so it's really important that partnership has actually enabled the work that we've done over the last decade, I guess, in, in focused on digital inclusion. But I'll, I'll quickly respond to your question with a different example I just wanted to share, which I think is really, um, it's an important result from the power of advocacy. And uh, um, just over a year or so ago, um, ALIA, which is the Australian Library and Information Association, they'd been advocating federal government departments for to recognise the role that public libraries actually play in delivering government initiatives. Uh, you know, as you know, a lot of um, initiatives get rolled out and it's public libraries who pick up the support, the communication, the skilling, and that sort of thing to the general community. So the Australian um, Digital um, Health Agency uh, was responsible for rolling out My Health Record, which is a it's a health information for each individual in one secure place. And so individuals can have all of their health information in one place, and also health professionals can access that with the appropriate security. So the Australian Digital Health Agency recognised that if my health record was going to work, it really needed a digitally enabled population. Um, and that population needed equity of access, awareness and trust. And they realised that that could all be delivered through libraries. Um, libraries help the 20% of the Australian population who aren't online. And that's because we provide free access to PCs, we've got computers and we've got staff who provide access. Um, equity of access, libraries are, can tick this because anyone can use a public library, there's no restrictions. And then of course, awareness and trust, 
libraries are very much trusted by our communities. So in 2019, the Australian Library and Information Association, together with the Australian Public Library Association and Alia Health Libraries Australia, secured a $1 million from the Australian um, Digital Health Agency to deliver training programs. So these programs have been run nationally and they're training programs for public librarians on how and community organisations on how they can support their communities to access my health record, but also resources related to health and well-being. So it really ticks off on that SDG three, um, and I guess also you know replicates some of the the services that Priyanka was talking about. So I think you know it was great work by Alia to to advocate and then to actually deliver on that program. So um, my library, the uh, State Library of Queensland has been working with Alia and APLA uh, to actually deliver that training through, uh, throughout Australia. Initially, we were going to do it face to face, but with COVID, we had to pivot to uh, the online environment, just as we've just all been talking about. And so we developed online modules. So th that has been a very successful way to train public librarians across Australia, um, and then also them then to deliver training in their own public libraries uh, to their communities to ensure that everybody has access to that information. So I think it's been a it's been a fantastic initiative that just demonstrates the power of show, uh, identifying potential partners, collaborators who share the same values and, and objectives that what you're seeking. And just to follow up, actually, the, the, the department, the government departments, government agencies you've been working with, and, and of course, in particular, the Australian Digital Health Agency, mm -hmm. these agencies that had previously thought about working with libraries or were these new connections being built? Well, we, I mean, we, in Queensland, we work with um, Department of Communities, um, so obviously have a connection to it, making sure that our communities are safe and well-being and that sort of thing. Education Queensland, uh, it's, uh, also Department of Local Government. So, you know, there's a whole range of different companies. Telstra, as I mentioned, has been a great supporter in funding programs nationally. Uh, in Australia, so the Tech Savvy Seniors is a, is a national program. So, um, you know, I think in every state library across Australian public libraries, there'd be different partners that they're working with. Thank you. And I think that that, that, that puts together a really interesting first recommendation, <clears throat> which you can sort of draw out and is especially interesting in the context of the SDGs, which really do look to bring together the work of so many different parts of government that there are so many different parts of government that depend or that could depend, could draw benefit so much from working with libraries, both as, as places where the people who are, where people who are not connected can actually get online, be digitally enabled, because sadly often people, if when people are on the wrong side of the digital divide, they'll often find themselves on the wrong side of a whole load of other divides. And so it's a great way of fighting inequality and getting people out of a vicious circle. Um, mm -hmm. But also and building. Yes. Sorry, Vicky. Sorry, Stephen. I was just going to say, particularly because public libraries are in every community, so you actually have that reach across your state or your country through your public library network. So I know that we have a lot of people come to us because we do have that partnership with public libraries, and so we can actually reach. And of course, people trust. Um, the people in their public libraries, they, they know their communities. And I think that's what Priyanka was talking about, you know, is that acting locally. So public libraries can do that local solution to a global problem. And uh, that really emphasises the, the, the benefits of working with public libraries. Fantastic. Exactly. So for, for governments working across, for departments working across the SDGs, it's important to think about this potential that the public libraries can bring this unique, often pre-existing resource that's there and that can support in your work. Okay, and now I'd like to hand over to Dilara for your thoughts on, on the recommendations you'd make to decision makers about how they can better support access to information as part of the response to and recovery from COVID. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, before re uh, I'm going for the recommendation, I would like to mention some of the activities actually <clears throat> taken by the Bangladesh government. Um, it's a very unique work they are doing. They're trying their level best uh, because the motto of Bangladesh government uh, is make the Bangladesh digital, digitalized. So in that, uh, in a motto, they have actually, the government has uh, uh, created three, four pillars. It's like one pillar is digital government, and uh, number two pillar is human resource development. 
Uh, three is IT industry and promotion, and fourth num is uh, connecting citizen. So they are trying their level best in this four uh, sector. And uh, we have a, uh, you know, uh, Bangladesh government, they have established a wing. It's under the prime minister office. We, we call it A2I, access to information. So through that wing, actually, the government is trying to connect with the citizen. So in a, for different, different issues. As. And we have an information commission in that commission actually run by the government is under uh, you know, information ministry. And they are also working on that. Uh, what are the right of right, right to information? What kind of information is uh, uh, you know, uh, the citizen of Bangladesh looking for? So they're trying to build this website and giving this free service to everybody. So the main point of recommendation is uh, from um, my side uh, in, in respect of Bangladesh. So there is a digital divide. So we need to think about how to minimize that digital divide, how we can reach the rural people, how we can, you know, uh, giving that information in, in everywhere in Bangladesh, not only, you know, the, 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 the you know, capital city based services. So that's why uh, I know the government is taking initiative, but I think they need to take more initiative in this regard. And particularly, if you think about East West University, from our part, we're trying our level best because we, I have already mentioned that we are running online courses and we found that not only internet connectivity, the device is also very important, accessing the resources through the device. If you don't have any device, then how you can use that resources? The East West University has taken this initiative and they are providing uh, laptops for the students. We already provided it's around 500 laptops for laptop for the students, for needy students, and we're planning to provide more. And uh, uh, Bangladesh government also providing the internet connectivity through the BDRAN. So there is a you know connect connectivity. Uh, it's it's like through that BDRAN you can get the connectivity easily from from anywhere in the in the city, in anywhere in the country. And. Uh, 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 second recommendation is to develop a, a, a sustainable infrastructure for getting uh, uh, the uh, access the information, for getting the information, right information, and the, the contents, right contents. And awareness campaign is very important. In a sense, people are not aware about what their right and how to get the access that information. That is also very important. So. Through that online awareness campaign, people will realize what kind of information is available in online. Like I can give you one example, when we started the COVID vaccine, uh, when we started in our country, people are a little bit confused. And they are, they actually, uh, you know, uh, they don't want you to take, take the vaccine. They thought, think that there are some side effects, maybe it's not good for their health, but when the government started campaign, the awareness campaign, that this vaccine is good for your health. Maybe there is a little bit of side effect. Maybe you have a, you got some fever for one or two days, but absolutely this is very, very good initiative. Through that, you know, vaccine, you will get a better life. Now people are realized, and now there is a long queue because everybody wanted to take the vaccine. The first part is already done, done uh, and uh, we are waiting for the second vaccine. So this is a very innovative and very good work from, from the government because the government successfully, you know, uh, plays that matter in front of the people. That's why people are realized this is a very good thing. And uh, another thing that we need to develop some strategies, basically uh, accessing the information from media. So we need to develop uh, a policy uh, media information literacy policy standard and some generic literacy module. I think that module should be included uh, 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 from the schools, mm -hmm. which is not right now, even not in university level. But some of the universities they have been corporate, like East Coast University. So if it is started from the school level, people will be literate, more literate. They can easily evaluate the information coming, which is coming in front of them, basically from media. So that curriculum incorporate is very important, not only in library information sector. I think in every curriculum, like in journalism, in communications, every field, every you know subject, they need this uh, you know uh, uh, you know this uh, curriculum based training. 
that will help them to access the information, right information, authentic information. So that's, we are facing problem. We don't know which information is from the authentic source. We are not, you know, capable to evaluate. We are not capable to analyze the, the information. Whatever we're seeing in the media, we believe on that. And social belief is very big problem in our country also. People think that, uh, okay, if you go to a village area, there's no COVID over there. And only the COVID is uh, you know, happening in the Dhaka city. So this is not true. It's just, you, need, you need to take some measure. You, know, you have to wear mask, you have to wash your hand. This is the regular thing we have to do it. And there is another good thing in, in Bangladesh uh, national education policy incorporated by the Bangladesh government and the Bangladesh government actually, uh, you know, emphasis on lifelong learning. So this is a good thing. So they have already em em emphasis on lifelong learning. So through that, you know, policy, we can actually uh, go further, you know, in further stage. So that's why curriculum development uh, minimize the, you know, digital divide. Uh, we have to literate the, you know, uh, citizen of Bangladesh, how to access the info, right information from the authentic sources, how to, how to develop uh, uh, their, you know, uh, mindset. Some people, they have their own mindset. So uh, the awareness creating campaign is very important. And that workshop, we can arrange, like government can arrange the workshop training program in this regard. So people will be li literate and they can do better in their, uh, you know, getting the information from the right sources. And one thing I would like to mention over here that, uh, that uh, the, the devices I have mentioned. So some of the, you know, government can take this kind of uh, activities also. Not only think about the, you know, that uh, internet connectivity, think about the devices and th think about the e-resources. Try to subscribe more e-resources. And, you know, due to this COVID-19, the publishers, they themselves, they have given some resources freely. They don't, you know, ask for, you know, a subscription fee. So we have, we are the people, library, and we need to disseminate that, that information to the people. Okay, if these are the information are freely available. Please, you know, take the advantages because publisher are, these are very expensive. That like says, you know, some of the Taylor and Francis they have given some of the portion of their resources freely because, of, uh, you know. University, actually, we are subscribing, you know, a lot of resources, and these are very expensive. We are paying a, a big amount for that, uh, you know, resources. But some of the portion they have given it free, so anybody can get that resources. Open access movement is very nowadays. People have to realize about the open access movement. Through that open access movement, people can get the information easily. They don't need to pay. They do no need to think about the financial barrier. And uh, of course, there is a language barrier is also over there. We have to think about how we can overcome this language barrier. Maybe you are looking for some information, but due to this language barrier, you are not access that info. You are not realizing what is written over there. So these are, are, are from, um, in, in my aspect, I think um, uh, th these things will be helpful for the policymaker to, better, to do better in, in this uh, sector. And librarian is a, I think that they are, the, they can play a vital role in this uh, area because librarian now work as a social agent. Library is, is a social hub. It's not like this, we, we are actually working with the physical books only. So social hubs change agent for society. So that you have to, you have to, real, you have to disseminate this kind of information to everybody. This is, this is your duty. This is being an information um, specialist. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And it's good, that especially at the end, uh, underlining the point that Vicky made so strongly about the specific role that libraries can have. I like the first point that you made about the Bangladeshi government setting up uh, a really central focus on information and the different aspects of information. And, and then, as you recommend, there are so many different aspects, questions around access to information that do need to be looked at in parallel to a fair extent of which to realize this potential. So the network, the devices, the skills, the content, getting your open access policies right, getting your copyright policies right. So there's really a case for this coherent policy rather than looking at things bit by bit. So now I'd like to turn to Priyanka for your, your take on the, on the question of what recommendations you'll have for decision makers, Priyanka. 
Yeah, so I would like to point out that in case of India, uh, with the recent government um, actually trying to streamline a lot of the system uh, requirements, um, there is a movement like it's called the Digital India Movement. The intention is to empower communities and look at how you can build knowledge, knowledge, knowledgeable you know, societies. Um, that is their vision and the Ministry of Information Communication Technology is um, looking into it. So in the past, uh, let's say about two to three years, um, or rather more than that, um, we've had a lot of work that's going on from the government, trying to make a lot of these um, services made available for communities. So for example, I can give you, we have something called the Aadhaar card. Now it's like a basic information. Um, it's like a personal identity card. It's like your passport that you're living in this country. It has basic information. Now they took it like a drive. You know, they literally drove the entire nation to um, adapt to it, and we were informed. It came in the newspapers. They made sure that all of us were um, were made aware that it's a very important document for every citizen to hold on to. Um, while in some cases there is a lot of emphasis, there are certain um, digital services like, for example, let's say the Kisan app, which is related to the farmers app. Not farm, no farmer actually, not many farmers actually know about it. So there is a disconnect. So because um, currently the government is really looking at how you can keep the citizens connected, I think it's very important that libraries play a critical role to support these government services so that they're not being misinformed. So when I say misinformed, I will give you a specific example during the COVID time uh, when um, there was this whole, um, um, you know, I think um, all of us were skeptical about it and still remain skeptical that there's going to be a health app which will be installed in your mobile and you'll have to be tracked. So <clears throat> when the government is doing an initiative that supports the citizens, I think we really need to be correctly informed about it. They are definitely doing it for our well-being. We understand that it empowers the community in different ways, in different lenses, depending on the places that they are in. It also reduces vulnerability. But a resilient community can be built only when that connection is made and ensured that there is certain level of streamlined information from the governance perspective. So that's very, very important. So it's great that we have X number of apps being you know, put into the system but we really don't know what's going on. And the misinformation is what triggers us from not even using good apps. It's only usually word of mouth. And in case of India, given the kind of population, um, as most of you are aware, we're close to almost 18% uh, of the overall uh, total world population. So it's quite a lot that we're dealing with. And it's not just for people who have mobile phones, it's also for people who don't have mobile phones. There are still rural communities and are also pockets in cities when people don't have access to this. So there is still that disconnect. That was my point when I started initially, you know, there's still this pocket of a population that still don't have access. And like Dilara rightly said, why not look at ways in which you can actually provide equipments, you know, or uh, look at ways in which they can take a loan or something like that, you know, where um, women, both men and women and youth have access to the smartphones. I can tell you that um, in the communities right now, um, this includes even in a house like mine. We may be adults having three mobile phones, but when my child has to do an online learning, I have to invest again in another mobile phone to make sure it happens for her. But can I actually buy a mobile phone? I cannot afford at this point of time because there are salary cuts and X number of reasons. Uh, the other thing is the mobile phone screen is very small. Is it digitally appropriate for the child to use such a small screen? It can hurt her eye. It can have an impact on her mental health. We don't know. See, these are agronomics that are also attached to the use of ICT tools that needs to be uh, thought very diligently. Now, while on one hand, private educational system kind of like enforce the need for all of us to get into a virtual learning mode, I'd like to also lay emphasis that the government is also doing their bit. So they kind of like, uh, I don't know, they quickly did it. They actually reworked on the content and made sure that major uh, subjects are made available through the television. So they have an educational channel that's being, um, um, you know, continuously screened so that uh, children can actually view it. But how many of them actually use this content which is being made available? So there is system that is also supporting the communities and sometimes communities don't want to access it. This is the reverse of it. 
um, because they're not being correctly informed. And on the other hand, schools are also pushing for them to do a lot of things from their end. So there needs to be <coughs> probably a certain level of streamlined localized mechanism that supports you know, the development of communities more locally. I'm going back to the concept of localization is because resilience cannot be built with a billion populations through a one single structure. It doesn't work that way. I think uh, the pandemic gives us a very serious um, learning that the more we decentralize the system and the more we give support to that decentralization to take place locally, it really will help build stronger and uh, resilient communities because vulnerability is not about rural communities. It's not about people not having wealth. It's also made me vulnerable during this pandemic. I think it's very important to understand that um, gone are those days when we felt a developed country needed more support than a developed, I mean, developed con developing country needed more support than a developed country. The pandemic has given us a space to realize that each and every individual matter, they, their well being matters, their right to live and have a citizen's right um, to have a, um, I think, farewell of balanced well being is our right is everybody's right. So keep doing away with all the disparities. If we can focus more on that, that would be really suitable to build resilient communities. And I'm going back to that because I've been working in that field for a very long time. And I can say that anybody can be put on a vulnerable spot at any given point of time. So this is very, very critical. And when it comes to policies, specifically to India, I can say that um, the states in India, we've had one of the oldest legislations put in place in 1948, but they, um, they're still undergoing rigorous transformations, but not all states in India are looking at legislative changes. Um, so we need to really redefine some of those legislations to make it work to the current trends and current requirements. And one of the highest recommendations would be that public libraries should become one of the you know, major um, mainstreamed actor to make sure that it supports a lot of the government departments that are doing a lot of work for the communities. I think in India, that's definitely required. And that would be one way to build knowledgeable communities through localization. So public libraries can become the knowledge centers and through localization, a lot of resilience can be built. And I'm saying it also from a perspective of the climate change adaptation, where they can be the localized hotspots, given that a lot of the weather changes and climatic changes are more centered to localization th these days and we need data related to that. So I'm trying to kind of like synergize some of these aspects to say the relevance of public library and localization. I think the other things that I would like to emphasize is how public libraries can, can become, um, you know, make access to Wi-Fi and um, just make it free to public access. Right now, in some libraries, it is free. In some, it is not. Uh, so why not the government make sure that it's completely, you know, the Wi-Fi and internet access is made available to anyone who comes into the public library. I think that's very, very critical so that it gives them the opportunity to access information. And um, the other thing I would um, probably like to emphasize on is, provide regular training so that the skills are developed. I think this has come back again and again in different ways. Um, today, if I don't know Zoom, I am defunct. I have to learn it on my own, but there are many people who can actually learn through the process. Can public libraries, uh, librarians uh, skills continuously be developed so that it supports the upcoming trends. We know we are in a fast moving world despite this lockdown and the changes that are taking place there is a need to make it more holistic. So this is something that I felt is absolutely required. And also saying centered to local vernacular. I think Dilara brought out this point. It's important that we make the content as relevant as possible for the local communities. That's when localization will take place. That's when you will see a shift in resilience. Uh, uh, otherwise we'll still continue to you know, be in, um, um, in a wonderful situation. And um, on a brighter note, I would also like to say that despite the lockdown, there have been communities who have self-empowered themselves by looking at alternatives and have found ways in which they can sustain their livelihoods despite you know, the barriers that they have had. So continuous support from librarians to be able to direct um, um, or rather, um, yeah, di provide um, how, how do I put it? Um, 
librarians actually staying more connected with the users is very, very important. I think that that is one of the missing links right now. Um, what, um, and, and I think um, in India right now, public libraries could actually have a certain amount of funds if it's being directed by the, by the government. I mean, we do have funds, but what I mean funding, I really mean really for these services, make it as expandable as possible so that everybody can be included through public libraries. I think that's very, very important. Um, we must have some more funding that will support the um, um, libraries to get repositioned and transformed into a space that will support community well-being. So these are the few pointers that I'd like to add for this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and I'm glad because we, we've reached time. So I was very glad that you talked about a high point <laughs> right at the end. It's always really good to finish on that. Thank you again for just underlining those points about the value of empowering the individual, empowering the local. And of course, this is so crucial to the SDGs as a whole, to the idea of this rights-based approach to development. And of course, the right of access to information to seek to impart information is, is such a key part of that. So, so thank you to thank you to Vicky, to Delara, to Priyanka for your for your, for your contributions, for all of your ideas. I think there's some really powerful messages in there about, firstly, the value of governments thinking across the board about why information matters, because the pandemic has shown so strongly that access to information is an issue across the SDGs. And that if we want to deliver on the SDGs during the pandemic, after the pandemic, we need to have a, we need to be able to think about this. We need to have a coherent, consolidated response. And then connected to this, making sure that we're working best through live is to deliver on that local outreach, that individual community focused response based on the knowledge of library staff on the ground with the support to be able to provide connectivity, to provide devices that's necessary. So with that, I want to just say thank you to everyone. Um, have a good rest of the day. I'm aware this morning, I've been, I'm gonna go back to bed. Um, <laughs> um, and we will make the recording available on our YouTube channel and website www.ifla.org probably tomorrow. So with that, thank you so much for your contributions. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank, thank you, Delilah. Thank, 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 thank you, Stephen. It was fantastic. I really enjoyed this. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.